All right, guys, welcome. Thank you for joining me for the webinar this evening. Uh, my name is Garrett McLaughlin. Tonight we will cover the in-season strength training formula for runners. Um, strength training for me, again, very versatile. Uh, regardless of your goals, you know, a properly crafted strength training program can help you get out of pain, improve performance, long-term injury prevention. Uh, so hopefully we'll cover some of that here this evening. Um, as we get going, feel free to drop an introduction in the Q&A. If you look on your screen there, you see that Q&A button. At any point throughout the webinar, if you have questions, comments, feedback, want to yell at me to slow down because uh, I often get excited and get going, yeah, you're welcome to, to write something in there for me to see directly, um, especially you know, where you're from, any races that you're training for, time when that race is, and you know, hopefully we can kind of give you some feedback on how to adjust and, and really manipulate some of these things we talk about to prepare for your race. Um, I will be saying, sending a webinar replay tomorrow at 11 a.m. Central Time, uh, 12 o'clock Eastern for you Eastern peeps. But if you can't stay for whatever reason and no hard feelings, uh, I'll get that webinar replayed for you tomorrow at late morning or, or noon. Uh, so goal here, how to properly utilize in-season strength training to excel at your next race, whatever that race is. Uh, during this webinar, you will learn the key training principles principles that will allow you to see unmatched results. Um, you'll notice I always kind of live by principles. These are the things that uh, really create the foundation or the support for a good program, the rules uh, and, and regulations, if you will, what to follow to really see good results. Uh, we'll cover some essential exercises, lower body and core training exercises, obviously based on your needs, your race your goals, your injury history, these exercises will need to be adjusted, modified, progressed, regressed um, to best suit you, but going to cover some of the staples that really belong in, in most runners program. How to navigate the taper. This is super important. I think a lot of times we, we work so hard and we get in our own way. So how do we get out, get out of our way when it comes time to the taper, that two to three, three week period of time before the race? Um, to really allow our uh, training to absorb, if you will, to, so we can see good results on race day. And at the end, I will be raffling off and or entering names to then raffle off uh, a complimentary 21-day uh, trial within the Healthy Running Program. So to help create you that specific in-season strength training program, a couple little perks as well that I'm going to throw in here for that for that lucky person. But stay tuned. You have to be present at the end of the call. If you're a current client, Enter your name. If you are the winner, um, I will deduct that amount off your next uh, month's payment, whatever that is. So make sure you enter your name in that. Before we begin, do me a favor, silence technology, uh, put kids in the other room, give them the iPad for a little bit, whatever you need to do. Let's try to limit distractions. Uh, I want to make sure you get the absolute most from this webinar today. So uh, it kind of starts by just kind of setting the stage and put yourself in a situation that you can really uh, take in the information and, and think about how it relates to you. Grab a pen and paper if you can have that handy. If there's anything that comes to mind, even just one or two things, right? What are the simple things you can take from the webinar today? Um, it's usually not some big earth shattering thing. It's just a simple strategy that can make a big difference within your training uh, because hopefully moving forward and, and starting tomorrow, you can take what you learned today and then implement to see better results with your running and your training. A little bit about me. My name is Garrett McLaughlin. I was born and raised just out of, outside of Boston. It's funny, my sister sent me this picture here. Actually, the day I was uh, running away from home as a kid, uh, family thought it was funny. You know, take the picture, pick, picture of me before I leave, suitcase in hand, smiling, thinking I'm going to take on the world. Got down to the end of the driveway, sat on the sidewalk for about an hour. They let me sit out there the whole time, came back, just didn't know where to go. You know, I was like, where, where, where do I go? What do I do? Um, so I didn't really know how to, how to function in the world at that age, got back home, mother was cooking dinner. Um, no one came up to, to, to find me or anything. I guess they wanted me to walk the streets for a little bit and, and see how it went, but, uh, we all survived and we moved on past that situation. I went to school in, uh, Connecticut, uh, Quinnipiac university, got a bachelor's in athletic training, sports medicine, and then a master's down in Miami at Florida international university Kind of an exercise physiology field there. Um, throughout my whole life, I've been active in a whole range of sports. This is why I love this topic, strength training, running, training, how to put all these pieces together. Um, I think from a, a training standpoint, 
just a longevity standpoint. I mean, that's one of my biggest goals is to make sure I'm still active and enjoying these things until I'm 80 and 90 years old. That's where the strength training piece comes in. I don't just want to do well right, on my next race or the next month. I want to set the stage now to be to continue being active later in life. Uh, currently living in Milwaukee, uh, working at a uh, kind of renting space, running my business out of a facility in Shorewood called Crux Chiropractic, a pretty cool facility in my opinion. Uh, the Healthy Running Program, which you hear, you'll hear, hear me mention multiple times, uh, is one of my most popular and favorite programs that I created back in 2016 while living in Nashville. Um, just providing runners with a whole range of services uh, to help them to see better results overall with their running. Other pictures here is Chris. I think it actually was in Grand Rapids. Uh, we were, I think it was January, a couple of years back. Went there. We were just skating at uh, some outdoor rink. This is my sister and I. It's a little, the little fun five miler last year. Um, please, no, no photos here. Don't be sharing any, uh, any pictures <laughs> of these me running away on the internet. But uh, within the healthy running program, just my passion help runners achieve a whole and whole range, whole variety of goals. These are some of the people I've been fortunate enough to work with and work with hundreds of people in the healthy running program. Um, for different reasons, right? We all have different goals as it relates to running. Some just want to run and continue to run, right? Without other things getting in their way, injuries, aches and pains, uh, or what have you. Some want to do better, right? They want to run faster, run longer, train for ultras, PR, half marathon, marathon. Um, other people, again, thinking about that longevity piece like me, want to continue running and being active later in life or starting to realize, hey, I'm I have grandkids now, you know, and it's not just about running, but I want to do X, Y, and Z to make sure I'm active with my grandkids or hiking or, uh, or what have you. So some of the main goals that runners approach me with, um, first and foremost, eliminate pain and return to running. That's one of the big pieces. Um, running, 70% of runners are getting injured each and every year. So uh, understanding pain, understanding pain is normal to a degree. At a certain point, we have to intervene and figure out how we're we going to rehab and help this runner get back uh, to running in a way that's not causing them pain. So that whole return to run process, which can be pretty tricky to navigate for some people. Long-term injury prevention, like I mentioned, not just in training well for your next race. How do we continue to train well and be active for years and decades to come, I mean, ideally? And then from a uh, performance standpoint, just to develop better running mechanics, improve race time. So if you're someone that wants to run faster, run more efficiently, um, and that piece for training to, to really improve performance and just overall quality of running mechanics. We do this through evaluations and movement screening, looking at the body to see what the body's telling us, right? How do we address a person's specific needs? And that comes from a good evaluation, slow motion running analysis, um, getting someone on a treadmill, looking at their mechanics, soft tissue manual therapy. I do what's called active release techniques. It's a type of soft tissue manual therapy, tight muscles, nerve entrapments, those kinds of things, people in pain, or is there a certain thing we need to do here to improve function, running, coaching, and form correction to me, one of the most important pieces, the coaching aspect of things. Um, I think you can follow a very good strength training program, but unless you are running in a smart in effective manner, following a good running plan, um, you tend to only see limited results. I think the coaching side of things is ex extremely important. And then what we're here for today, fireworks, strength training, and injury prevention. So why this topic might matter to you, like I said a second ago, 60 to 70% of runners get injured every year. So if you're someone that just wants to run in a healthy and sustainable manner, that's where strength training fits into things. Uh, if you have races on your radar, you want to understand how to really maximize your strength training program in order to create good results. Um, what I notice is it becomes a lot, right, for, for many people. We're talking about running. We're talking about strength training. We're increasing mileage. We have a job. We have family. We have personal commitments. Um, so if you want to be just more efficient and effective with your time, how do you manipulate your strength training um, to these busy times of the year as mileage increases and there's really just a lot going on? Um, so you don't lose, right? You're not, you're not losing strength. You're not losing power. You're not setting yourself up for injury. You're actually continuing to build or maintain in some way. Um, and it's usually possible with a good program. Uh, and kind of like me here, it's more than about running, right? It's, it's being active later in life. It's, it's 
doing things with your family and friends and just be able to go out and live on your terms. Uh, most of my runners, I would say all of my runners, that's why we kind of get past solely talking about running goals, health, fitness, wellness. How do we tie in those other pieces, nutrition, hydration, sleep, recovery, uh, mindfulness, and the mental health side of things, right? All those come into play because at a foundation, we want to be a good, well-functioning human being and then focus on being a good runner secondary. I think a lot of times we put running on top of everything else and, and things fall by the wayside. So if we want to do things well for years to come, we need to focus on the big picture. What I envision for you moving forward is just to be more proactive with how you take care of your body, right? Let's, let's stop reacting to things. I think that's one of the biggest problems why injury rates are high in running. Um, we're training, we're running, which is great. Something happens and then we react to it. Then we go to physical therapy. Then we go to the doctor. Um, if we were more proactive, one, it's, it's more cost effective, right? Get an evaluation, get in a running analysis, do some little things on a regular basis, whether that's part of your dynamic warm up or your cool down or, or just some simple strength training to take care of your body on the front end. Um, so I hope from this webinar today, you realize, hey, you know what, there, there's more I can do without spending every single day in the gym that can really help me long term. Uh, I hope that you have a deeper understanding of how to manipulate your strength training program over time so it can consistently deliver results for you, right? We want this short program to fit around your running. It's not something that's going to replace or really just get in the way of. Um, it should fit around your running in a nice way where it's not overwhelming. And then I want you to use your strong and reliable foundation to pivot and be successful in other areas of life. So like I mentioned before, um, again, strength training doesn't just help running. It helps just overall strength as you do daily chores, confidence, self-esteem, like other things as well. I had a lady that her mother-in-law fell a couple months ago and the family joke joked after she went down and she just, she just picked her mother right up off the ground. And they were like, wow. Like, and she's like, I didn't realize I was that strong. I actually did it effortlessly. And it became a joke in the family, like how strong she was. Uh, so just be able to have that strength, not just for running, but just for anything that can come up and happen within life. And obviously would love to work and help um, any and all of you here. I think obviously that's the quickest way to see results is to really individualize and get specific here um, as we can hopefully map out a program for you, but not just focusing solely on running, right? Making that a top priority. Yes. Health, fitness, wellness in those other areas as well. So question for you guys, take a second. What brought you to this webinar today? What did you see that attracted to, attracted to you to it? And is there a key thing that you want to get from the webinar? So I'm going to wait about 30 seconds here. Drop a quick line. Click that Q&A button on, the, on your screen. You could be on a cell phone. Could be on a computer, what have you. Um, you'll see a Q&A button on there. What is the most important thing you wish to get from this? And kind of what brought you here today? And I appreciate you guys being here. I just want to make sure as we get into the content, I can help really mold this to your needs as best as possible. Take a second and drop a line for me. Wait till a couple more people add in here and we'll see what we get. It's always delayed as it comes through on my end. So training for a couple races this year, just looking to stay healthy, looking for tips for peak season strength training for cross country. Awesome. Assuming a younger athlete here. Um, how many days per week and how much is needed from a strength training standpoint. Awesome. All right, guys. So let's get going here. Let's jump into the content. Feel free. If you guys want to drop me a note at any point, click that Q and a button and drop it in. We'll start with, start with the principles. So principles of in-season strength training, uh, and I'm going to dive into these more specifically and in greater detail in a second, but just to introduce them first is periodization. Second is less is more, one of my favorite. 
favorites, specificity, and then kind of the contrast there, variable loading. So we're going to dig into these one by one and, and discuss how you need to think about these things and look at your current program. Hopefully you have a current program. If you don't, these will create that kind of that foundation for the exercises and things you add in there. Um, and you can hopefully select the best exercises based on that principle. So periodization, um, great quote here. I took this from Wikipedia. Periodization is systematic planning of athletic or physical training. The aim is to reach the best possible performance in the most important competition of the year. It involves progressive cycling or various aspects of a training program during a specific period. Plain and simple, we want to understand what the goal races are first and foremost. Most runners, right, could be, we'll, we'll, we'll just say an April goal race, and an October goal race. Um, I usually recommend limiting, right, as opposed to saying, oh, I'm running a whatever every single month. Okay, that's great. We can't periodize 12 times within the year. We're going to plan for April race being our best one and October race being our best one. Other ones are going to be more training races, um, and we're going to try to peak for those particular races. Cross-country season might be different, right, whether we're uh, certain races that help you get into, I don't know, district, conference, whatever there is. Uh, from a cross country standpoint, or if there's a state meet and you already know, hey, we're, we're going to be there. Um, so that might fluctuate just a little bit, but your training needs to change and adapt throughout that process. So if we look at from a running standpoint, from a simplistic standpoint, um, mileage is going to build, right? If we think about how many miles we're going to run, everyone knows we're going to start and creating our base early on. We're slowly going to build up mileage week after week as we get ready for that goal race. Once we finish that race, we kind of take a step back, right? We allow the body to rest, recover. There might be some type of low key period here, the off season, uh, where you're running in more limited miles or training in a more limited way from an endurance training standpoint. And then we're going to go ahead and repeat that process and build up for that next race. So that's how we uh, go from kind of off season to in season back to off season from a running standpoint. When we layer in strength training, strength training and running have more of an inverse relationship. So as running builds up, strength training has to back down. Uh, we need to make sure we're not just adding more stress on the body. I see a lot of people that running does not go well, rather than changing what they're doing from a running standpoint or just accepting, hey, this is just not going to be my, <laughs> my best race. They try to add other things into the mix and end up getting hurt in the process because they're already building mileage. They're doing speed work. They're, they're stressing the body. They're adding this other stressor called strength training into the mix. And then their body has to recover from all of this on a weekly basis. So what we try to do is we, we really focus on building a good foundation from a strength training standpoint early on. So if we just look at, we'll take, we'll talk about now. Okay. So I'm training for an April half marathon. November and December were my months where my running was more focusing on building just a very low key base, working on strength training uh, as much as possible, two to four days per week, get stronger, work on power, plyometrics, all of those things. Once January hit and I got into what I would say is my structured 16 week running plan, uh, mileage starts to build up, start to adjust and really fine tune my speed work as my strength training backs down. Uh, this is the relationship as, as things ebb and flow throughout the year. We need to make sure we're not just doing everything at all times. It's not just foot on the gas pedal in all areas. As one thing becomes more of a priority, the other thing starts to take a back seat. Um, so this is where being proactive with your training matters because there are specific times during the year where we need to focus on really dedicated strength training, right? After you finish your maybe April or May race, uh, so maybe uh, May and June, you hit the weights hard, train for your next race, back down the strength training, get past that race, November, and December, running back down, strength training cranks back up again, right? We start to ebb and flow throughout the year. And this is a really good recipe uh, for long-term success, success, as opposed to pushing things at all time and hoping for some good luck that you recover. Um, the relationship here will ebb and flow. So during the off season, like I mentioned, those more low key running times of the year, our goal from a strength training standpoint, and obviously not what we're going to focus in this webinar today, is to build a bigger cup, as I say. So if this is your foundation at the time when you start off season strength training, our goal is to get stronger, more powerful, better stability and balance, more resilience and explosiveness. Um, so essentially, we want to build a just a better all around foundation for the body. But as you get into in season strength training, 
our focus is we just don't want that cup to overflow, right? We've hopefully already spent the time in the off season building a stronger and more resilient foundation. We've gone from the small cup to the big cup. Now we're managing how much stress, how much water we're pouring into that cup at all times. In season, as we build up for our gold race, right? That's 16, it depends on the person, 12 to maybe 24 if we're talking about um, ultra, ultra marathoners as well, 12 to 24 week period of time. That's our in-season training plan. Um, we want to really manage how much stress we're placing on the body. The more we push in all areas, the more likely that, that, that cup is going to overflow. Overflowing is, is, is burnout. It's overtraining it's injury. So our goal here, we're going to start pouring that running stress into it as we're going to start dumping out some of the strength training, right? We're not going to add in all areas. We're going to do things in a very very strategic way, but our goal is volume management, right? How are we managing the amount of stress we're putting on our body so we can perform well in that specific task, which was running, uh, while also using strength training in a, in a more low key manner to supplement that. Now, less is more, I just wanna see if I missed anything. Less is more from a uh, strength training standpoint as you get into the end season, like I mentioned. Um, Pareto's, I'm actually reading right now as well. It's funny, I put this in here. Um, what's it called? It's called 8020. Um, Pareto's 8020 principle, which states 80% of your re results is actually coming from 20% of your effort efforts. Something I think about constantly those days where even from just a work standpoint, I'm like, man, that was a lot. And I think about what things that I actually work on today that were productive towards my end goal. And they say that 80% of your results comes from 20% of your efforts. Is there a way where you can simplify what you were doing, really identify what are those key things that are creating you these the results that you're after, and then cut out and get rid of some of the excess? Um, like I mentioned, if we're trying to manage volume as much as possible, if we can simplify our training in some way still we need to focus on building the miles we need the speed work we need to we need to push the needle um in that regard but the other things probably have to back down and, and strength training does so work on identifying which aspects of your strength training program delivers the greatest value what this will allow you to do is just be more time efficient if you're running more miles right you it's going to require more of your time so we want to try to eliminate how much time it's taking us from a strength training standpoint this will allow you to be just recover more effectively on a weekly basis. Better recovery, right? If we think about the equation, stress plus rest equals growth. If we have better recovery, we can positively adapt to the stress we're placing on our body. If we just stress, 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 um, there is no growth, right? We're training so hard, which is I think the biggest downfall of endurance athletes, willing to put in the work on a regular basis, not willing to pull back at the right times to actually adapt positively to the stress they're placing on the body. This leads to injury, this leads to poor performance, leads to just being frustrated, like, hey, I'm working so hard, but I'm not getting anywhere. And then if we can manage all of this appropriately, we can train hard and properly without the fear of overtraining or injury. Next principle, specificity. So a question to ask yourself, what story does your body tell you? Um, what do you need to address for you specifically, right? I can give you exercises. I know what exercises help runners that are specific to the demands of running. But within your program, I want you to be specific to you. What is your injury history like? Do you have a history of hamstring tendinopathy, Achilles tendinopathy, a, some type of bone stress reaction or bone stress fracture? Um, calf strains, plantar fasciitis, like what is your injury history specifically? Because those are things that you need to take in consideration within your training program. Because you've had a past injury, you're more likely to have a recurrent or flare up of that same injury. So we want to make sure we address that. And then thinking about how your body functions, your range of motion, your power, your strength, your endurance, stability, balance, proficiency of movement, just how well you move are there differences in range of motion from one side to the other? Is one leg stronger than the other? Just had a conversation with the guy earlier, actually it was yesterday, differences going on, right? Your right knee is an issue uh, from a stability standpoint. Left hip is an issue, that hip is weak. So within his program, we have specific things that are gonna isolate those areas to make sure we're, we're trying to create symmetry as much as possible. Um, because biggest thing I've seen over the years is the more miles, the more speed work and intensity you put on top of a uh, broken down system, right? The more you're going to magnify these issues. So we need to make sure within the strength training program, yes, we train for running. We'll talk about that in a second, um, but we train our bodies in a specific manner that help us just move and function better. Next up, what's the outcome you want to achieve? So like I said a second ago, running, right? You want to be a runner, better runner. You want to 
perform well during that goal race, understanding the demands of the sport. Running is a single leg plyometric like activity. Every time you push off and land two to six time your times your body weight is coming down and impacting on the ground. So do you have the strength? Do you have the shock absorption, the stability to withstand that constant demand over and over again, right? If you're running fast, right? Fast 5Ks, a lot of force, a lot of load. If you're running ultra marathons, a little bit slower from a, a pace standpoint, but tons of contacts into the ground, right? Out there for hours and hours on end. Um, so we need to understand what is the demand of the sport and then how within our strength training program are we going to address that? So we look at your body specifically, in the sport or the task, the activity that you want to get better at. And then we kind of come together and find a happy medium um, to make the program as specific as possible. Always like this quote, Lily Tomlin said, I always wanted to be somebody, but now I realize I should have been more specific. So you can dictate that, right? Who's the per who is who do you want to become, right? What runner do you want to be? Okay, let's understand where you are, where you want to go, and let's create uh, that end result as much as possible with a good strength training and running plan. Megan, just a quote from Megan here from last year. Uh, Though I've always understood strength training to be an essential component of remaining healthy while running, it has only been in recent years that I discovered the importance of running specific strength training. Post-collegiately, I dealt with several injuries that could have pre been prevented had I known my individual weaknesses and addressed them proactively. Knowing what I need to strength training in order to achieve my running goals has given me clarity and confidence in my ability to stay healthy. So a couple of things there, right? Specificity, individual weaknesses and how to address them. And then proactive, right? That's one of the biggest things I said in the beginning. I want you to be more proactive. If she would have known we could have done. We can, we never know. We don't know when things are going to happen. Most likely something is going to happen though. When injury rates are about 70% of runners getting injured each and every year, we can expect something to happen at some point, but if we are proactive and we're specific, uh, we can hopefully mitigate that as best as possible. Now, from a variability standpoint, right? Two of the, the best ever here, we have Elliot Kachogi on the right side, one of the best uh, runners, and we have Roger Federer, I say one of the best tennis players um, that have ever played, but we look from a, a variability standpoint or variable loading. These sports are very different running sagittal, right? Running forward linear, not much changes that same movement pattern over and over again. There's not much variability in the sport of running tennis in contrast. I hope you guys are watching the Australian open right now, multi-planar reactive lateral forward, backward, um, so many different motions, forehand, backhand, slice, volley, right? There's a lot of variability in the game of tennis. Like you need to be a very good, more well-rounded athlete because you're, you're asking the body to do so many different things. We need to understand from a variability standpoint that running, right? We're only doing the same thing over and over again. Some of these research studies have shown this one is specifically on footwear. There's a 39% lower risk of suffering from a running related injury and wearing more than one pair of shoes, right? Not just really trying to get into the whole footwear thing right now, but just understanding when you put the body in a situation where it's able to um, expose itself to different forces, different demands, different stresses, different ranges of motion. Um, it adapts to all that, right? So we want to be adaptive. We want to be able to be, we want to create a resilient foundation. Um, they found, again, if you alternate, the, it alternates the running pattern, it varies the force on the body and the body then responds to that. Why this matters is because from a strength training standpoint, you know, whether you're participating in different sports, you're varying the load on the body, you're adding strength training or some different type of stress on the system, we can use these from an injury prevention standpoint. So even though in-season strength training, I'm telling you, hey, you need to back down a little bit. It's, you probably should have done a lot in the off-season. We want to continue strength training alongside running um, just because we can continue to add this variable load on the system that can hopefully mitigate and reduce our risk of injury. Uh, we found that through research, previous injury is one of the most significant risk factors for future injury. So you better believe all the people that I work with, we're taking into consideration all the injuries they've had in the past. Hey, you, your hamstring used to bug you. All right, we're going to address that in here. Oh, your lower back, your Achilles, your this, like those are pieces of the program. Um, we continue to strengthen. We continue to address because we know it's more likely for them to suffer that injury again. Um, so biggest thing I took from this research study, which fits into the, the variable loading or variability principle, multiple shoe use and participation in other sports, I also say, and a good strength training program are strategies to potentially leading to a variation of the load applied to the musculoskeletal system. They could be advised 
they could be advised to recreational runners to prevent running related injury. So adding different stresses on the system that's not just specific, not just that running forward motion of running, moving in different planes of motion. You can see like, like Messi here. Um, that's another important piece to realize from an in-season strength training standpoint. Now, as we talk about essential exercises, obviously these are going to be general things that I recommend from a strength training standpoint. Um, it would be your job to individualize, to ask questions. Um, I would say majority of my exercise, my, my clients are performing, they're probably performing all of these in some way. I don't necessarily know if they're all completing the, this is kind of the basic look. Um, we probably have progressed at some point to harder variations, different exercises, or just a, a unique variation that fits them better based on how they're completing their strength training program, but it should give you a good lens into that. So strength training goal here for in season is target risk factors associated with injury, maintain strength, endurance, stability, and balance. Um, I think that's important to right? We need to understand kind of when to slow things down. It's not always about gaining and improving in every area at all times. We're maintaining from a strength training standpoint so we can prioritize running. Um, and then hopefully expedite the recovery process. I'm going to show you a little uh, blurb or quote from Don in a little bit. Strength training, to me, the biggest uh, benefit I see from a lot of people as they get into strength training properly longer, uh, they bounce back quicker from a lot of their runs, right? So if if you are have a stronger and more resilient foundation, you start adding mileage onto that. It doesn't affect the body as much. We have a strong foundation. Running's only kind of taking so much from a... Um, I guess from a stress standpoint. So over time, I'm seeing people that are recovering from their long runs more quickly. They're finishing their race and thinking, hey, should I have run harder? Like it's it's been a day or two days. Usually I'm sore for six, seven days after uh, or something hurts. So the further you get, further along you get from a strength training standpoint, the better you're able to respond to your training because your body has that capacity uh, to perform and perform well. So some key exercises here. First up, we have the squat. You cannot go wrong. These are my bilateral exercises, which means bilateral. You're using both legs at the same time. Um, I like these exercises because they're a good way to give someone a nice heavy resistance. You're doing them on both legs. You're not really worrying about balance or stability. Um, so this first one, goblet position, holding a dumbbell to the chest. You can also use a back squat or some other squatting variation. Good way to axial load the body, right? So one thing we always talk about that's very prevalent from a running standpoint is bone stress injuries. So to be able to create that axial load gravity and the weight of the um, whatever resistance is coming down in the body to load the bones in each individual joint um, to help hopefully increase bone mineral density as well. Um, so on this exercise, knees out, hips back, lowering down. This one is with a little tempo. You can see I'm trying to go down one, two, three, and then back up. So working a little bit on that power component as I pop out of that low position. Next one here, we have the deadlift. So deadlift, this is more of a Romanian deadlift. Uh, this is going to work now more so posterior chain. You can say the squat is a knee dominant exercise and the Romanian deadlift is a hip dominant exercise. You can just see how the, the differences with how those are performed. Small bend in the knees, hinging through the hips, then driving the hips forward to stand. It's almost like an upright hip lift or hip bridge in some way. So good stability and control through the, the shoulders and the core and then hinging at the hip joints only. Um, depending on the person, right, amount of flexibility, you can get a good degree of like hamstring stretching and flexibility out of this, and then strengthening those hamstrings and glutes as you drive the legs forward. So obviously no weight on the bar here, bar is 45 pounds, something I would recommend, again, cranking up the resistance, heavier dumbbells, uh, adding some plates on the side there, really try to load this up as much as you can, but making sure a good back position, nice long spine, as you move through. These are typically, I would say, heavier strength training exercises. Um, so as you build these up, a nice heavy resistance, uh, maybe two to four sets of, uh, for most people, four to eight repetitions. So lower repetitions, higher resistance to match that to really make it challenging. And it's kind of a good combination to see success with these exercises. Now, as we get into some of the single leg stuff, and we're talking about getting more specific, right? Running is a single leg plyometric like sport. So we need that single leg stability, that single leg control and strength. First one is a step up, um, foot up on the bench. I would say shoes off for every single one of these. Uh, we're talking about single leg instability. The foot matters quite a bit. Getting the foot out of that running shoe as much as possible with, with the foam and the drop and, and all of those things. 
um, try to get the foot to connect with the surface and that will really help you create good stability of how that foot secures down. Step up, kind of driving up with that single leg, good control going up into single leg stance. I usually always go up into single leg stance. I don't stop, just step up and have both feet on the bench. I love that whole driving through motion that's more specific to running, right? You're on one leg, you're driving through. So one leg is pulling you through the motion as the other one is swinging forward and preparing for foot strike. So really good single leg one. At all times, looking at the position of the knee too. So that foot is on the ground, barefoot hopefully, or socks if necessary. Um, knee is in alignment with that foot. So as you go up or down here in the step is the tendency for that knee to wobble, right? It's gonna kind of collapse in and move out. You wanna try to align that as much as possible to create a good stable position. Next, we have the split squat, probably one of my favorites as well. Knee dominant exercise, getting a lot of stress through the quad and also that lateral hip. So if I put my left foot forward here, the outside of this left hip is really having to stabilize and control my position. It's pretty much just a stationary or static lunge, right? I'm setting up in positions or have to stabilize and control the entire time. I usually make people do these more static versions first, right? I'm stationary as opposed to stepping back into lunges. Lunges, you'll see they're promoted as probably the best exercise for runners, which I agree with that. Um, but getting people to own their stability the entire time, as opposed to dynamically, all right, now I need to, I need to step back. I need to control, right? A lot of things typically go wrong when you ask, when you throw more variables at people. Um, so this allows just a very simple way to load up the legs, to work on stability um, and really build strength as well. Next up, this is a simple one. Um, this is more like a, I would say a prep exercise, even though for a lot of people, I put that in the program, depending on how long we've been working together. Uh, lateral toe taps is great because we're, we're just sitting slightly into the knee and the hip. We're not lowering too much, but as you move that leg out to the side, that band is tugging at the knee. So you can see right now, my left knee is being, it's trying because the right leg is being, is going out to the side. That left knee is being tugged inward. And now here, that right knee is being tugged inward. So I need to really stabilize that leg to prevent that knee from collapsing in. Um, so really good single leg stability exercise, tons of glute activation, tons of stability required at the leg to maintain alignment, and then using that non-wear weight bearing leg to really throw things off, right? It's creating an environment where you have to stabilize against that external movement. All of these uh, more accessory movements, I would say anywhere of eight to 12 repetitions, um, two to four sets, it really depends on kind of how much you were doing before to determine how much you should be doing in the in-season. Um, but shoes off as much as possible, good quality movement. If you fatigue and you start to really uh, see things are falling apart, take a second, rest, reset, no need to push through crappy form. Um, just try to execute these as fluid and stable as you can. Now, earlier I mentioned variable loading or variability. These are some lateral movements. I tend to add more lateral movements as people get further along within their training, they're doing so many miles, they're running 30, 40, 50, 60 um, miles per week, always going this way. Okay, how are we going to break them out of that pattern just to preserve overall range of motion, uh, open up the hips, work on flexibility, work on strength in just a different way, right? Vary the pattern. This first one is a lateral squat, feet are in an offset position, nice wide stance like this. Um, and then I'm lowering back, sitting the butt back, aligning that knee with that second toe and sitting into it. Um, so strengthening through the hips, glute medius, glute minimus, opening up the adductors, which tend to be tight for a lot of runners um, and teaching the body how to move into that frontal or lateral plane. We can progress that by doing something like the lateral lunge. Big step. This one has a little bit more of a shock absorption and power component to it. You have to land more force, absorb force, and then quickly push off to propel yourself back over. So that actually is a lateral lunge, single leg stance, um, which I think I did okay in some of these. You can see a lot more stability required. I often throw that stuff like that in there just to, I think he's shaking, shaking my head, um, put that in there to, to make people slow down. You know, I want you to control this. I want you to have enough force off that leg to propel you all the way back up. And I want you to own that position, that single leg position. Um, so it just causes people to slow down to really control it. Triplanar lunge can be anywhere, right? Could be a good warm up prep exercise. Could use this just as a good multi planar drill within the strength training program, moving in different planes of motion, forward lunge, lateral lunge and then going into transverse lunge, moving in different planes of motion, 
Uh, so we think about the hip joint, that hip joint is positioned forward, that hip joint is positioned lateral, that hip joint is rotating. We're moving the hip in so many different positions um, to really make sure we're, we're keeping again, bones, joints, muscles, ligaments, all that stuff healthy, um, but just moving in a nice fluid, fluid manner to maintain strength and stability. Now the calf, the calf is probably something that needs, and you need to be careful as you build mileage because um, you're getting so many foot contacts, you're pushing off so many times as you run and running is a plyometric sport. You don't want to overdo the calf training. Um, so it will vary how much I stress the calf based on the person. Um, the calf and the quad are actually the, the two biggest muscle groups that are um, challenged from a running standpoint. So we need to make sure we strengthen the heck out of those. So especially in the off season before you get deeper in your miles um, and then earlier on in your training and probably start to kind of fine tune things later on as you get up to high mileage. First one here is just a, a classic single leg calf raise. I do have a what's called a deficit. So you can see there the foot is on the, the plate. I have an additional range of motion. The reason I like this is because the calf needs enough range of motion to go through that running cycle. So this allows or cause or challenges a little bit of flexibility in addition to strength, which is great. Uh, we want to make sure to preserve it. So that, I think that's where I I think as you get along with your strength training program, we're talking about cutting things down, being more efficient and effective with your time. How do we multitask, right? Okay, this is a stretch at the bottom. It's also a strengthening exercise at the top. All right, two birds, we can kill two birds with one stone there. So these are the things I think about as I lay out the programs, depending on what the mileage is. Someone's like, you know what? It's, I'm running a lot of miles, time's cutting down. I can only do 20 minutes of strength training. All right, so I have these 10 things now. How do I cut that down to six? but still get the same results or if not more results from those six exercises. So efficiency and effectiveness is super important to figure out how these things fit together and apply to the person. Soleus Walsh, it's a good one, isometric here, challenging the calf and also the quad, that deeper soleus muscle there. Um, so here you can see the difference. I'm strengthening that calf complex, but I'm doing it in a bent knee position. So there are two muscles behind the calf, the gastrocnemius, which you can see here, uh, on the top one is the outermost calf muscle. Deeper down inside behind that deeper calf muscle is what's called the soleus. It actually is the predominant uh, calf muscle for running since the knee is always in a slightly bent position. So to challenge that, we need to bend the knee. So that's where this wall sit variation is not a super common exercise, but such a good one. Um, you know, classic wall sits we probably did years ago as kids, low position to 90 degrees, elevating the heels, and you'll feel that deep burn and the soleus wall set. Same thing on these, anywhere from two to probably three repetitions. Uh, calf raise, eight to 15 reps. Soleus wall set, usually anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds, depending on how long you can hold that. From a strength training standpoint, I always am fairly simple. Um, and I just think I go back to running and, and just the demands of running. There's whole, not a whole lot going on at the core while you run, right? We're trying to transfer energy, opposite arm, opposite leg, or moving. Uh, at the same time, we're transferring energy kind of diagonally throughout the system. We want the rib cage to be centered over the pelvis from a stability standpoint. Um, and then we just want good stability and strength around there. Usually, you don't need to do a lot of crazy things, but just master the basics while focusing on good breathing. So first one, dead bug, checking my lower back position, moving opposite arm, opposite leg. So as I move these limbs away from each other, just seeing, hey, is my back starting to arch? Because I want my core to be stable enough and my focus to be good where I can just control that movement um, without getting into an arch position. Tons of variations to put on top of this. Once you master it, most people master it usually, it could be a couple of weeks, could be a couple of months, but not long. Hardest part, it's usually the coordination as opposed to the stability uh, component of it, but breathing as you go through these. So you'll notice on all of these exercises, uh, my spine, I'm not rotating, I'm not crunching. I still add those into a degree for some people. We want to mix things up and, and move in different ways, and it's good for just life. But these are more stability-focused exercises. So as you set up for all of these, exhale. <sighs> rib cage comes down, core can engage, and that's where I'm saying, hey, I'm putting the rib cage right on top of the pelvis in a good position. If I didn't, I'm in more of this arch position, ribs are flared. This isn't the best relationship to create stability throughout the spine. So I can, you can see just by breathing and exhaling, how I can manipulate and adjust my position and then hold that position as you perform all of these movements. Next one is a uh, hip bridge. 
I'm actually going to show you a variation of this is a hip bridge, a band resisted hip bridge with marching. So classic hip bridge, but now strengthening into the hip flexors. Hip flexors, are another important muscle, calf, quad, hip flexors, um, especially with faster running. If you're adding in some speed work in there, if you find you're, you're a triathlete or a cyclist, you're sitting on the bike for a long period of time, rather than just stretching the hip flexors, really work on building strength in that area can be super helpful. So I need to make sure as I'm pulling into the resistance of the band, this one's tough. First, not slingshotting the band across the room, which happens to everyone the first time. So getting that band to really lock on the foot, getting the hips up fully, and then marching one leg at a time. So that left glute's contracting as the right hip flexor, flexor contracts, and opposite right glute, left hip flexor. This is very specific to the act of running, right? So it's just a way we can progress that hip bridge. Side plank, traditional side planks, you can't go wrong. Trying to make sure we can hold a minimum, I usually say 60 seconds per side. Once you get better at traditional side planks, then lifting a leg and making it single leg, really working obliques, glute medius, muscles on the outside of the hip, as those really help stabilize the leg and secure the pelvis in place as you come down and land on a single leg. And then a little bit unconventional, but super important, uh, two dumbbell marching, right? Holding a heavy pair of dumbbells and then just marching down and back. You see that single leg component, but the dumbbells are providing this little bit of sway side to side. I obviously don't want to sway like that. I'm locking in my body position. I'm marching down and back without allowing any type of movement out of that position. It's a good way to tie in single leg stability, core strength and stability at the same time. Shoes off again. I'd highly recommend on an exercise like that. So question, a lot of people ask, and I think majority of the questions during sign up were how often and when. Um, so you really need to understand it's based on your training history, right? How much are you strength training? If you're coming to me now in January, we'll say February 1st, you have a race in April. If I decide, hey, it's a good time to add strength training, you only have three months until your race, it probably would be very limited, very short, very sweet. Body weight wouldn't go in, in too deep into that. Uh, if you've been lifting your whole life, you just come off of lifting three to four week, four to days per week in the off season, like, okay, we'll probably get into a good one to two days of strength training, but really it revolves around that running plan. Um, so it's always based off what have you been doing? And you'll notice where, when I talk to a new client, it's, it's always, all right, tell me about your running. What have you done over the last six weeks? What is your longest distance? How many miles have you run? What are some of the paces you've ran? How many strength training days? What exercises? How heavy were those? I'm using that to then moving forward as opposed to saying, hey, everyone should be strength training two days per week in the in-season. Like it's going to be so different based on the person. I have some people that do 15 to 20 minutes twice a week. I have some people that still do three to four times. Um, but those are people that have probably been lifting their entire life and were really in good control of their program, their nutrition, their sleep, all those other components as well. Typically one to two times per week is a, is a good place to be, 30 to 45 minute sessions. Um, like I said, you can get multiple things within one exercise. We start to get do combination exercises like, hey, can we do squat to press as opposed to just a squat and then a shoulder press or, or different things that we combine into one to hopefully maximize the session and get them moving. From uh, If you're considering or wondering what days should I strength training on based, based on my running, that's a hard question to answer. I always tell people, first and foremost, block off a day somewhere. Block off one or two days. What are your rest days going to be first? Like That's your priority. You're running. You're training anywhere. Who knows? Anywhere from three to six days a week, we'll say, from a running standpoint. Block off your rest days first. Those are no-no. Those aren't strength training days, right? Those are rest days. And then from there, where are you going to add your strength training into your plan? So if you have one day still left, all right, that should probably be a strength training day. Do you have a, an easy, low mileage running day? Okay, that's probably a good running day. Should you do it maybe after your speed work and combine, again, the most stress of your week in one day so then you can recover from that? That might work for you. Um, I always tell people to respect the speed work. We want the speed work to be good quality and respect the long run, right? Those are the things I think just a common courtesy to our running we want to respect. I want those things to be good as you execute them. I'm okay if one of your easy runs is pretty crappy and your legs are sore. I'm okay with that. I don't think you're going to be so sore here with this type of lifting in the in-season, um, but I think you need to respect certain parts of your running that are going to give the best, uh, biggest bang for your buck, and that's the speed work and the long run.
Uh, so Don said, I know that finding time for strength training is often an issue. We'd rather be running. But one of the things I've noticed soon after starting with Garrett's program was that my legs were really sore, even after an 18 mile trail run. So I don't need to make time for daily foam rolling and random stretching or multi massages. I think Garrett would say that because my legs are stronger, they are better equipped to handle the running. Uh, right. So if you have a better foundation where we create strength training, usually there's less tightness, usually there's less stiffness, um, less aches and pains and those things. So uh, I always, a lot of times I tell people, Again, foam rolling, if you need to do that stuff, do that stuff, but let's focus on building a better system so you don't need that as much in the, in the future. So hopefully by doing the strength training the right way, we can eliminate some of these other things. Hopefully save you money in the process as well. From a massage standpoint, don't need a foam roll or spend the time to do that. Could be a good situation. All right, guys, so let's try to get through here in the next couple of minutes, talk about the taper maybe three minutes or so, and then we'll answer some questions and start to wrap up here. Enter the names into the raffle. If those any of you are interested in um, that 21-day trial healthy running program so I can help create you a strength training program. So from a taper standpoint, taper is a structured reduction in training volume for a specific period of time prior to athletic competition as a way to enhance performance. So interesting, right? We're talking about actually taking a step back to improve performance. This is back to that less is more principle before. Um, two to three weeks is kind of the typical amount of time where we can reduce the volume. So we'll say, for instance, if you're doing, uh, if you're running 40 miles a week, you hit your peak week, your race is in three weeks, you're going to start to taper and reduce volume. Um, so over those weeks, you're going to maybe knock off. We'll say you go from 40 miles a week to then I'm just making this up. Uh, 32 miles a week to then 24, we've reduced our volume of our training by 40%. We're actually allowing ourselves, right? We're, we're kind of reducing the amount of fatigue on the body. It's a, it's a low key, more resting period. We're still training. We're not stopping our training at all. Um, but what it's allowing us to do is reduce the amount of fatigue that the body is experiencing. So then we can replenish the amount of glycogen within our muscles. So over the, the, entire training program, we've taxed ourselves to a way where we've used all of our energy source. So we're fatigued. So if we rest, replenish, take a little step back from a training volume standpoint, we can bounce back muscle glycogen, muscle power to then really see good results on race day. Um, so we need to make sure we're respecting this period of time. A lot of people overlooking it or not really giving it as much respect as it deserves. I'm actually I have something blocking my screen right now. I'm trying to look at what the last thing says. So studies have shown that an increase has been an increase in maintenance and fitness levels despite reducing volume. So and rest assured, right? You're taking a step back from a training volume standpoint. You're running less miles, but you can actually perform at the same level, if not at a higher level, from taking a step back. What we need to realize here is volume backs down, intensity remains the same. So from a running standpoint, we still are doing our speed work. We're still doing our strides. We're still doing those faster runs. We're just not running as many miles. Same thing from a strength training standpoint. We're trying to cut down. So if you've been doing two strength training days up until this point, we might back down to one. We might back down to one and a half. If we were doing three sets of each exercise. We're going to go from three sets to two. I still want those exercises, those sets to be fairly heavy. It's not like we're going, hey, I was doing a 40-pound squat, and now I'm going to drop down to a 20-pound squat. No, I want still do a 40-pound squat, but instead of doing three sets of 10, let's do two sets of 10, or let's do one set of 10, right? Let's back down the amount of volume, but maintain the intensity, and that's where we see the best results. You need to be smart about exercise selection and timing of workouts. Obviously, we, we want things to be structured in a way here that allows the body to adequately recover. Um, we don't want to get in the habit of, hey, I'm running less. Let's add more strength training. Um, to me, that's reactive of, hey, maybe you're not confident enough in your training plan or you're not where you want to be. So we're trying to add strength training to make up for poor running. Um, but the key thing here is maintain relative intensity but reduce the total amount of volume. And that would obviously vary based on what you're currently doing within your program. Uh, like I kind of alluded to, sorry, I move this back into the screen. Generally speaking, the problem with most athletes is not a lack of training rigor, but demonstrating discipline and pulling back uh, on training when necessary. Hard to do. You need to trust that what you've already, all the work you put in has already been done. And now it's time to reap the reward of your training.
Uh, Jessica says, during the taper, you're tempted to do more, but don't let self-doubt rattle your game plan. Keep this in mind during the taper. Do you want to win the workout or perform on race day? Which I think was nicely put, right? So keep in mind, right? You're still doing, you're still executing the right strategy to get ready for race day. It's not about that one particular workout or doing more workouts. The work's been done. Um, it's time to really kind of pat yourself on the back, prepare for the race and know that you'll arrive at race day again fit or more fit by really executing the taper. So things we covered today, let's get, let's start wrapping up here. Think about any questions that you want to throw at me to, to finish. Um, key training principles allow you to see the un unmatched results. Again, don't just focus on the exercises, really try to digest those principles. How do those relate to your program? Those will provide the foundation. Uh, to me, everything I do is so principle based but individualized to each and every person, right? The program could drastically change, but those principles to me, they always hold true, right? So if I can follow and respect those, um, people tend to see really good results. We covered some exercises, see if you're including those in your program, see what things you're, you're struggling with. Is you're lacking strength and power? Okay, maybe the squat and the deadlift is needed. Um, do you have poor uh, stability and balance? Maybe those, the split squat, the lateral toe taps and the step up. Um, getting up in your mileage, do you need to move in different planes of motion? Um, those are the things to really take in consideration with those exercises and obviously making sure form is on point. Taper, we just talked about. Respect the taper. Uh, do not neglect that. So question for you guys right now as we start to wrap up. Did you see one to two simple areas you can improve? Hopefully jotted down a couple notes there. What are those one to two things you feel like you can change within your routine right now? There's certain exercises that you should be doing, certain principles you should be following, or something that maybe like, man, I've been, I've been kind of going about that or, or thinking about it wrong. Drop a quick comment in the Q&A, and then let's kind of get ready to wrap up here. We'll see what a couple of people say, and we'll start to wrap up. We'll enter names into the raffle, see who is the lucky winner for that, and then we'll uh, get on with the Thursday night. Let's see. Specificity from Avon. Yeah, super important. Uh, with all the stuff you're doing too, right? You know, I've, I've worked with Yvonne in the past. Hard working as heck, right? One of the hardest working people I probably have I've ever met. But thinking about how to be specific to running triathlon, her body, her individual weak links and things and injury history and getting all those in play alongside a very busy triathlon schedule, right? That's where things can be tough. <laughs> I wanted to drop in for a minor what not to do. I hear you, I hear you. Hopefully we uh, got you thinking a little bit and got you back on track. Pulled you off the edge of the cliff there, which can, can happen to you triathletes. Anyone else, any, any other key points that you took here today? What are you walking home with? I'm going to give you another 15 seconds or so. Would you recommend doing some strength on speed day? Uh, yes, I don't, I don't think it... I honestly don't care too much about the days. I think you need to make sure if it's a speed day, your speed day, that happens first, most likely. Uh, I want the speed work to be good quality. I want you to be executing, I want you to be hitting the paces, and then maybe follow up with some type of strength training after that. Um, some people I have done the other way. I've done some, some heavy strength, some power exercises before speed work, because it's more neuromuscular and then done speed day. But I have no problem of those being on the same day. From a bone standpoint, depending on the person, when you start strength training on running days, we, we generally want to space things out a little bit more. If we can space things out six to eight hours, if you've had a prior bone stress injury, that can be important. Um, if you don't have a history of bone stress injury, less important, but still something to respect uh, from a, from a long-term right injury prevention, longevity standpoint. So you have no problem with you doing the, the strength training on a speed day. All right, guys. So I know I've kind of thrown a lot at you. And this is always what I feel like after I finish a webinar or a course, like, all right, what now? Like, I know the things I need to do. I need to navigate this uh, cold, dark world, especially out here snowing right now in Milwaukee on my own. So if you feel like, hey, I, I know I need to get to this point here somewhere in the middle of the maze. I'm not sure which direction to turn. I don't want to get caught in those dark hallways. I'm 100% happy to help you fast track this, throw a ladder up right here, allow you to walk right over and save some time and suffering. I, for a lot of people, I know runners, endurance athletes like to figure stuff out though, right? Hardworking, willing to put in the time. Um, you will get lost in the maze. It's going to happen. 
Um, but keep moving forward, keep digesting information, keep figuring out what you can do for your specific body first and foremost. Um, but obviously at the point, be on the cautious side of things. The injury rates are so high from a endurance training standpoint. Um, don't push to that level. Always have a little bit in reserve, right? Because uh, we don't want to push so far that we're injured and then we have to start again, but more from a deconditioned state. So if you need help as we as we move forward past this webinar today, obviously I will be raffling off um, one spot in the Healthy Running Program to help design all this for you. But the Healthy Running Program, like I mentioned multiple times, that's my big program, helping runners, endurance athletes, triathletes, um, train coaching, strength training, injury prevention, manual therapy, all of that stuff, depending on where you are, right? Are you a local athlete? All right, let's meet in the facility. Let's do these things. If you're remote, we do all that virtually as well. So location really doesn't matter. The three big outcomes I always try to achieve here is we lay out a strength training program in season specifically, right? Again, yes, in season is the focus, but we want to focus on, we want to understand what does this athlete want to achieve long-term? So let's not just focus solely on that race in April. We're going to get you there, try to do as, as good as possible, but we're going to focus on the big picture. Where, we, where do we want to be in, in a year from now, three years, five years, and help move you in that direction? Um, obviously, we want to do so with less aches and pains, less injuries. The more time you spent rehabbing and going through the, the medical system, the less time you're, you're spending actually working on your performance goals. So let's keep you out of that whole side of things, right? We, with a good program, we can hopefully reduce your risk of injury, um, again, lessen the severity of things. Things are going to pop up, but you can usually manage those very well with a good strength training program to then maximize performance on race day. So for the raffle here, and if anyone, if you're not the raffle winner and you still want help moving forward, this is kind of some, some details on the healthy running program. So we'll, we'll help you create an in-season strength training program. So understanding your race, doing a thorough review of what does your current training program look like? What's your injury history? What are those low hanging fruit? Usually as you understand someone's kind of their background story, you start to see, Ooh, there are two, three years that either they're not, they're not doing or they're not really doing properly, right? They're doing all of this stuff. I find that from a lot of, for a lot of endurance athletes and they're working hard, but they're not working hard or spending their energy in the right way. So how do we fine tune them, tweak those dials to get them to see better results moving forward? Um, it always starts with an in-depth evaluation in session. So we wanna understand your strengths, your weaknesses, your injury history, how well you move, because like we were talking about Yvonne said, but also earlier specificity, I want to be as specific to your needs as possible. So you become just a better functioning human being that can then run faster, jump longer, whatever you need to do kind of with that. Um, and then lay out that program within the coaching app. So within the coaching app, lay out the program specifically. If you're in person, obviously we could do some sessions together. If you're remote or not in Milwaukee, lay that program out within the coaching app um, to help you understand what are those exercises, how many to do, where should it fit alongside your running. Um, and then obviously if it's something, if you don't win the raffle and something you do and it's not good, which I've never had happen, but I always tell people to speak up, right? Or forever hold your peace. 100% um, money back guarantee because I don't I don't want your money. I want your results is, is what I'm after. So I always think about people always ask how much these programs cost. And I always think to myself, how much money runners are spending on a regular basis on other things, right? When we don't do the good inch season or, or focus on a good running plan, doctor's visits, physical therapy, imaging, running shoes, gizmos and gadgets, foam rollers, trigger point guns, all that stuff, buying things offline, it can get pretty costly. So I always tell them, just focus on yourself and your foundation first. If you're doing the right things here within your program, you usually don't need as much of that stuff, right? It doesn't cost you as much in the long run because um, you're creating a foundation that's resilient, able to tolerate the force and demands of running. And then you can also see good results in the process. So my goal here with this 21 day trial was to just add as much value as possible um, in that short period of time to help you get closer to your goals. Uh, in a more reliable way. For people that are here today, we're going to actually not just the strength training program, but add on top of that running analysis and also the custom running plan as well. This is something that I've been adding for everyone. I used to say, you know what, do you want to do strength training only or do you want to do strength training plus running? I actually have got away, gotten away from that just because I feel like um, now and in last year alone, the results were pretty significant. Um, the number of injuries were so low. The 
again, just what I saw people do from a, a running standpoint, from a training standpoint, a race day standpoint was so good because we put together the pieces better. Uh, we didn't just do strength training or just do running. How do we combine everything together in one cohesive program? As I continue to heckle people about nutrition and, and sleep and recovery and those things and have my support staff in place. Um, but we will add running analysis and running plan for you as well. So it's not just going to be the strength training program. Um, that's kind of just a perk of the add on perk here. So 187.49 is the cost of that 21 day trial, all of those things included. This is something if you don't win the raffle, which I'll enter names to in a second, um, this is only available to the first three people. So make sure, uh, shoot me a comment, let me know if it's something you're interested in. But what I want to do right now is if you're interested in entering your name into the raffle, if you're a current client, Enter anyways. If you are the winner, I'll provide that uh, that 187.49 off your next month's payment. So make sure click that Q and A button right now. If that's something you're interested in, you want to work together, want to create an in season program, um, let's enter names right now. I'm going to pull up my phone and I'm going to do a random number generator. We're just going to do it on the spot here. See who enters. I'm going to take another. I'm going to say 60 seconds right now. I'm going to give everyone 60 seconds to enter. If you miss, I'm sorry, but get your name in. And let's see. Let's see who we will call on. Get the dog outside the door waiting for me, chewing on a bone. Thank you, Yvonne. Thanks for coming out. Enjoy your run. All right, guys, let's see how many people. I'm going to wait 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'll recount that in a second just to make sure I'm not messing up. Should be everyone nine, perfect. All right, random number generator. I'm just gonna do this based on how people put in. Number six is one, two, three, four, five, six. Emily Steele, congratulations. You are the lucky winner. You can see here, I did my random number generator number six at the top there. Uh, so you guys can, uh, can actually see that. Um, but I appreciate you guys joining the raffle today. Emily will connect directly. Any of you guys that did not win and you're interested, um, like I mentioned, three spots only um, for that deal right there. So make sure you reach out directly. Questions right now. I'm over time. I apologize. I actually thought when we were getting through the the principles, like, man, I'm getting ahead here. We're gonna get done at uh, we're gonna get done at 650 my time here, 750 some of you guys. And I was kind of excited, but always go over. So I apologize about that. Any final questions as we move on here? I think Tammy recover from an injury, prevent any other injuries, right? Do an evaluation, getting specific. To me, strength training is rehab. Rehab is strength training. They both go hand in hand. It's just along a continuum. Some people I have right now that are, oh, no barefoot. Actually, I'm actually in socks right now. Uh, sorry about that. Are you barefoot? That's that's the big question. Um, other question, Emily, and hopefully this is you, Emily, hamstring tendon re-injury. So, that's something I think so commonly I work with, uh, hamstring tendinopathy specifically, um, sciatic nerve issues or radiating symptoms down into the leg. Um, biggest thing I think is making sure you're being careful with sitting, limiting sitting for a period of time with driving, working, depending on what you do. So stand-up desks are helpful. Strengthening the hamstring in more hip neutral positions, like your uh, ball curls, long lever bridges, being careful with Romanian deadlift and other movements, which compress the hamstring tendon. There's a lot of little details to look at with that. Barefoot life is, life is, <laughs> Uh, everyone else, I think we answered the questions here. How many days per week, strength training, exercises to do, timing, how many days per week, frequency and duration. That's it. So I appreciate you guys joining me for this Thursday for the webinar. Hope you took something from it. Emily will connect soon. Anyone else, anything I can do to help you moving forward, uh, please be sure to reach out. I'd love to help out in any way I can. But thank you guys for joining. Have a great uh, Thursday night.
and uh, have a good rest of your week. Thanks, everyone.